Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another episode of Mark and Mitch Make a Scientology Film. Uh, let's get Mitch in here. Hey Mark. Hey Mitch. Great to see you again. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been um, a little while. I understand you've been busy, which is a good thing. Yes, I've been all over the country over the last That's few great. weeks. That's great. And um, yeah, well, but we're back. And today we have a special episode for you guys because we have tracked down one of the actors who appeared in many of the films that we've already covered. And um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, let me welcome you to Alan Barton. Hello. Alan welcome, Barton. Alan. He's an welcome, actor, Alan. playwright. Good to see you guys. Uh, yeah, I just, if I could say something before we go on, this is like the Jerry Springer yeah. show. You're seeing a reunion in real time, okay? Yes. I, 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 Alan was a dear friend, a great actor, I, one of the people I really I mean, this is literally our first conversation in over 20 years. Yeah, and so uh, I just want the audience to understand you're seeing something very unpremeditated. This is live, spontaneous. Alan, I just want to reach through there and give you a hug. It's so great to see you. Yeah. My mind is just like bursting with all of these these experiences that we had because you know it's, yeah we were working for scientology and it's an evil cult and all that but we were artists doing our thing and you know at the time we thought we were doing something good so so happy to see yeah you. it's so great to see you i'm so glad you um made your way through and out so and to see you and you look exactly the same as i remember oh, like thanks. you haven't been touched by age or years or anything so whatever deal you made i want it yeah I, there's a painting at my house in the closet that's aging very rapidly Okay, uh, good. So, yeah, so a portrait. There you go. <laughs> the last time we spoke, Alan, was when you were writing a play uh, yeah. called Disconnection. Yeah. That, um, that, did, and it, uh, what, what year was that? That was the uh, Disconnection happened in 2015, but you and I spoke while I was writing it in 2014 and 15 because there's a scene in the play. Yeah. between two Sea Org members, married Sea Org members. And uh, and I sent it to you basically for like, does this pass muster? Like, is this what a conversation would be like between two people who are facing this? In that circumstance, I really wanted to make sure that I had it right. Yeah. Uh, and so you helped me out by reading that scene and sort of uh, saying, yep, yeah, <laughs> that, that's pretty much how that might go. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we did uh, two runs of that play in Los Angeles in 2015, one at the beginning of the year. And it was like bonkers, was like practically sold out the whole run. And then we brought it back in the fall with a, a change I made to the beginning of the play because, you know, when you're a playwright, you're watching your own play. You're like, you know what? This opening scene <laughs> yeah. just doesn't cut it. You know, like the, yeah. the, the place is full, like everyone's going crazy. And you're like, I'm not happy with the first scene. And when it's, <laughs> when it's your theater and your play, you got the uh, the chance to be like, you know sure. what, I'm gonna fix it. Sure. Um, so, Would but that matter? was an amazing experience and amazing to see the people who came out, who, um, people who I knew, and then a lot of people who I didn't know who were in at a much higher level than I was, or even worked in the Sea Org or worked for Miscavige. And uh, the conversations I had after that play, sometimes for an hour or more, were really something else, really something else, so. Well, I, you know, I hope you do yeah, it again, ahead. Alan. I hope you do it again because I would, I would yeah. miss it. And I would I'll send it. you the script. Yeah, at least Please, I'd love to read to it. Read it. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. One of the um, one of the fondest memories I have of uh, Alan and shooting on the set was when we were doing the film TRs in Life, TR One, which and is when we first met Alan. Yeah, 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 and I we remember shot. It clearly. We shot all these vignettes throughout the entire film with different characters from different time periods and different walks of life. And at the end of the film, all of these people are sort of um, mystically um, conjured into this course room, a Scientology course room, where they're going to learn how to do these yeah. training routines so they can sort right. out whatever problems they had in their individual right. vignette. Right. Yep. And we and, had, uh, there, there was, I just want to say, Mark, there was, uh, we had the heavy hitters in terms of the cast totally. in that film. Cause we had Alan. Sorry, I missed that last Anderson. question you guys cut out. What was it? Uh, we, we, were saying, we were saying who we had in that film. We had Jason Begay. We had um, Larry Anderson. Um, yeah. Larry Anderson. Carl uh, Zamudia. Mm -hmm. uh, Elliot, me. Yeah, yeah. 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 There was all of the, 
amount of heavyweight Scientology actors, Scientologist mm -hmm. actors. Were yeah, the whole gang was there. Yeah, like, you know, if a, if a jumbo jet would have hit that stage. <laughs> <laughs> no more movies. Yeah, Scientology yeah. film production would have been shut down yeah, for years. Forever, after forever, yeah. <laughs> But when when we got every when we had to get everybody back for the scene, there was so many. I want to say there was at least fifteen or so different actors that we had to reunite. Right. And some of these people were on TV shows, or um, some of them actually were working actors. And it was hard to get all of them out to this Air Force base in the middle of uh, the, <laughs> the middle San of Fernando yeah. Valley. No, no, and, uh, um, oh, San yeah. Bernardino. Well, no, it, San Bernardino. No, yeah. yeah, it was yeah, it was way out there. It was like a full hour. Yeah, it was literally Indian, there. you know, literally Native American Indian country. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And there was no air conditioning. Yeah. So that that was, was really hot. The actors you. were just pissed. <laughs> yeah. So we're getting everybody there. It's a million, it's at least a hundred degrees inside the studio. Yeah. We have all these lights on and the makeup is melting. Out. Yeah, we can't turn on the air conditioning because it makes all this noise. It, yeah, we brought it, in a portable, by the way. Alan said there was none, but we brought well, in one. Yeah, of no, I remember we, there was like a, a a big, and we would all go near it and like, ah, yeah, uh, ah, <laughs> ah, ah. that's exactly right. It was like this giant flexible hose that the actors yeah. would, would cluster oh, yeah. around in between the was, scenes. You could there. crawl into it. It was big enough that you could actually crawl in and cool down. Yeah, yeah. but um, so I wanted to ask you, what was that like? Like uh, from our end, it was a, just a giant cluster. It, it was, it was a nightmare to do to work, even to work in that studio because it didn't have air yeah, conditioning. Sure. It was in the middle of nowhere. Right. We didn't have any kind of food services or craft services or anything. But it was quiet. Yeah, it was quiet. <laughs> it used there to be a new no life within ten miles. But it also used not to even be a, not even a scorpion. <laughs> yeah, they were like, no. it's too hot. They were dead. <laughs> the, the dead scorpions in the restroom. I'm sure you found a yeah. couple. The studio that we shot in used to be a nuclear bunker where they had yeah. they, that was like a secondary location after whatever's in the mountains in Colorado. Well, yeah, it was built as a, a yeah. movie shooting studio, but it was yeah. built to withstand a nuclear attack uh, because out right outside the studio was a runway, and they used to you know take you know to, to like transport jets and not while we were there, but you know, uh, fighter jets. And so they built that studio so you could hear a pin drop while there was like an F-16 fighter taking off outside. So yeah. it was really so quiet in there. It was kind of scary. And we yeah. also believe it was the site where they filmed the alien autopsy because we found evidence that that had oh, yeah. happened there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of freaky stuff in that yeah, place. Yeah, really freaky. Yeah. But, but it was cheap and it was quiet. Yeah, but I wanted to hear from Alan. What did what was your impression, and what was that like compared to going to well, other shoots and working with other crews? Well, it was uh, at at the time you, I mean, the conditions you described. We're we're all agreeing about the conditions. The first thing we remember, it was like ridiculous. But for as an actor, you know, and I was I was not like some big time Scientologist. I was like you know Celebrity Center guy doing courses and stuff. You know, but got sort of pulled into audition. I got this gig. Uh, but you had to get sex checked. You know, you had to uh, you had to go through these right. clearances to to work and to be hired, and it was like this big deal. And my father worked in the defense industry, and so there was kind of a hitch because it was like, what did he do, and where did he work, and uh, like all. This. So there was this sort of big uh, hump I had to get over just to get onto the. Yeah, but in all in all fairness, Alan, you also spoke uh, fluent Russian, so even I was suspicious. Okay. Yeah, so there there is a, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, it's That's a little a questionable trip. there. <laughs> you know, one of the big commercials I got when I was still acting, I, I had to speak Russian in it. And it was shot out in that area, too, at some point. Yeah. Um, but uh, I remember my first day on the set, which was in L.A., because my scene was I was a traveling salesperson and this right. hapless housewife. Right. She opens the door and I try to sell her something and she has a crush on the salesperson. And it was my first day on any gold set. So I had no idea what this was. Were, right. were these people prissy? Was this like <laughs> a, a solemn journey of a spiritual awareness? Like, what was the vibe? I was a little bit scared. My first day, da, da, da. I didn't know who Mitch was. He walks over and, he, you know, we do a little rehearsal. And <laughs> Mitch walks over and gives Mariana Elliott, who's playing the housewife, the following direction. He says, just look at him like you want to F his brains out. Okay, like he, he opened the door and here's this guy, you just want to F his brains. And I laughed so hard because Mitch has got that very humorous way of delivering these things. And I went, oh, this is going to be fun. Like the director's cool. 
and you were cool, Mark, and Sadie, and like all these people yeah. who I remember, uh, like were very cool, accessible, fun people. Yeah. So when I read, yeah. when I read your book, Mark, and when I read Mitch recently, your book, to see the behind the scenes of the horror show <laughs> under which you guys were working, as an actor, you were really shielded from that. Yeah. At least I was. Like mm -hmm. for me, working at Gold was a blast. Other than the drive, and sometimes the conditions, you know, once we got to the new studio, it was lovely. But, you know, Norton was a shit show. But um, yeah, uh, <laughs> to put it my vibe that you guys created on the set. And I don't know if that came from Mitch. I don't know if it was just that particular crew at that particular time, late 90s, I think this was. Uh, it was honestly a lot of fun. Uh, there was a great yeah. camaraderie and, a, and an easygoing thing. And it, to, for, for yeah. the actors, it didn't feel rigid. It had the yeah. same, you know, the the robotic arm from hell on that shoot. You know, I remember Jason McGay losing his cr shit because he was the one yeah. working professionally and he was making yeah. a special effort to get out there and he was fucking pissed and he's got a, that temper. And uh, so it was tense because sometimes the actors were tense. But what you guys created was really a fun environment. Uh, I had a yeah. blast generally yeah. working for gold. I looked forward to going out there. Uh, mostly because of you two and Sadie and who was the camera guy? The he was uh, John. Pakistan. John Gonzo. Yeah. John yeah. Gonzalez. Yeah, yeah. Good Is guy. he still in? Yeah. 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 But a sure. wonderful guy. I mean, and I don't. Yeah, know really sweet like guy. Behind. Yeah. I don't know what he was no, like he, behind the scenes. He was a good guy. Um, yeah. Well, I so just that's what to, the experience I, was like I, for, I, as an actor I, for I, me. At least. I think, thanks for that, Alan. I, that, that's kind of. I think it was our intention to do that. You know, I've spoken with Sterling Tompkins. I don't know if you knew Sterling. He was a Sea Org member, a young kid, and I had him in a number of films. And he mentioned about how, for a staff member at Gold, it was like being in the studio and being in a film was like an oasis because nobody could grab you out. You weren't going to yeah. get in any trouble during that time. But I just want to, I feel kind of obliged to say because you did reveal the fact that I gave Mariana Elliott a kind of a, obscene direction. I have to tell you, Mariana thanked me for that so much because. It did help her to get to the absolute perfect. perfect oh, to, like, yeah. And Mariana is totally cool. Like she's not yeah, someone she's, who. No, and this no, was no, also, no. you know, I, this was late 90s. It was still... I don't want them to think <laughs> yeah. that I was using, you know. Yeah, but even late <laughs> 90s already is a generation enough that you're like, yeah, yeah we spoke differently then. And there was a different yeah. attitude about how you spoke yeah. to people. But Mariana yeah. was totally cool with you. She yeah. loved you. <laughs> yeah. She no did. problem. Yeah, no we problem. did you, she, we did shoot a ton of things with Mariana as well. Yeah, she was she yeah. was in probably just about as many things oh, yeah. as Alan was yeah. in. in the end. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, she's terrific. Actress. Yeah, I don't know what she's doing today, but I, she was. There were a few people that I was. I felt there were good friends that I actually saw outside of the, the that. Yeah, she worked uh, with me at the Playhouse for a long time, and then honestly, uh, it, it was actually my play ended it because she was kind of ordered to from wherever the ethics at CC or whoever oh, she was still, uh, basically yeah. gave her, gave her a, uh, you either quit that place or you can't do, do so the she, courses she or whatever she had. Disconnect from you because yeah. you play. I haven't seen her since. Disconnection. Uh, <laughs> Correct. I haven't seen her she, since. Is she still in Scientology? I, oh, I think, I, so. I, I, I would think so, but on that really? level where she's been in for 25 or 30 years and still isn't clear. I don't know. But, yeah, um, this is terrible. It, it anyway. may just be. I think for a lot of people, it's just something that's comfortable that they do. It's a routine. It's. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to get. You guys know way more about. Well, yeah, that but trip than I would. Still, you 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 do have a place to speak on that. I mean, I I think of that as as community and structure, which is yeah. important. Like a religious community, quite a separate from the belief system, is an important yeah. thing. Any kind of community like that. So sometimes people. They just need that support and that community, which Scientology can give you in some situations, not in the sea yeah. world, uh, for sure. Yeah, but. well, there's that, there's that, uh, what I found when I, I mean, I had been out for a number of years for various reasons, and mm -hmm. it wasn't until, whatever, 2007, seven, eight. you know, Jason Begay did his videos, and then right, the right. blogs, the blogs were starting to come out, and Rathbun, and, uh, you know, and I was like, Huh? <laughs> what? You know, I, I would be up until three or four in the morning, sometimes reading yeah. and reading. Could not believe because I had been there. Like when right. I read Mark's right. book, I was like, I was on set an hour before this hellacious, awful, abusive thing. Yeah, 
Yeah. I was sitting, I was sleeping or watching TV in the G's, the, the guest quarters, right. which were really quite nice. Lovely right. service. Right. You know, you had a service person come in and anything you need, blah, blah, blah. While Mark was running laps in the mud or whatever <laughs> crazy <laughs> shit. Like I was flipping these pages. I couldn't believe that I was sitting there like, yeah, what a professional run set. Ooh, I'm having so much fun. And like, there was just abuse happening all around. Oh my God, what a journey. But for a guy at my level, going to CC was fun. There was fun people there. There was a piano in the lobby. I got to play it. I got to yeah. work in these films. I became kind of within that universe, a bit of a celebrity once those movies came right. out. Like right. you'd get talked to a certain way or like, you know, you got that little taste of what it would be right. if right. you became a celebrity in the real world. Um, so for me, it was honestly a, a lot of fun. I never had any difficult time other than production difficulties or right. fights between, <laughs> I don't know if you guys were aware of, uh, sometimes there'd be these epic fights between, um, was it Hillary who ran, who was the host? Yeah. yeah Hillary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Somewhere between her and up above her and Milton Katselis, who ran yes. the playhouse. Yeah, uh, there'd be these huge battles about me and my time because Milton would be like, I need him for a meeting. And if Milton needed you for right, a meeting, because you were for those who it. don't know, you were an executive at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Yeah, like yeah. way up there. So if he needed me for a meeting, that was it. And I would be like, well, I'm supposed to go do a reshoot at goal. <laughs> yeah, he'd be like, yeah. no, he'd be like, no, you're not going. Tell him you can't go. And I'd be like, uh, uh. Uh, my boss <laughs> says I can't that. go. And then there'd be this battle of like intention without reservation. Like who can out town for the other one? Yeah. Like yeah. these battles. And I'd be sitting there going like, um, uh, so sometimes I don't know if you remember, I'd shoot until two o'clock and then come back for a meeting Yeah, yeah and yeah, then yeah, go yeah, back yeah. out and right. sleep overnight, shoot in the morning, go to the playhouse for a meeting. Right. <laughs> you know, that right. would be the, <laughs> well, well oh, now man, you, you, you You've brought up two things here that I want to address. One yeah. are production difficulties. I want to get back to that. Sure. But you also brought up the Beverly Hills Playhouse, which a lot of people watching are not going to know. They're not going to yeah. know anything about. So maybe you could give us a little background sure. on the Beverly Hills Playhouse, because it actually played well, a very important role in the Scientology community in Los Angeles. Yeah, the Beverly Hills Playhouse is one of the big acting schools in Los Angeles. It's been around for you now 40 some odd years, and it was founded by a guy named Milton Katselos, who was a very, very famous and legendary teaching. We had a little internet and glitch. He was, yeah. Are you there? Yeah, yeah we're there. You, just, you glitched out for a moment. Yeah, yeah Milton sure. Katselos there's, was. A, there's occasional glitches on my end. Uh, I have a good signal, but it's glitching here and there. Yeah. Um, so Milton Katselis was a very, very famous acting teacher. He started the Beverly Hills Playhouse as a school. He was also a very well-known Scientologist. And really before the era of Tom Cruise, right. I think in Hollywood was considered one of the main opinion leaders or one of the most foremost upstanding, like, I am a Scientologist. Yeah, Go yeah. F yourself. He was out there up front. He was personal friends with Hubbard. He knew Hubbard. Yeah, there was a picture of the two of them. I remember it to this day on the ship. Behind uh, Milton's desk, there was a picture of him and, and right. uh, Ron on the ship. So very, very close ties to Gench and all the people who started CC. Very tight, very close relationship. And for a period there in the mid-late 90s, there was a tremendous flow of people back and forth, like Div 6 to the Playhouse, Playhouse to Div 6. There was this it, kind it, it of... Became a, it became a, a sales funnel. The Beverly yeah. Hills Playhouse was kind of known as a sales funnel for Scientology. Yeah, but it was more, it wasn't in the classes. Like if you were to sit in a class, it really wasn't there that right. much. Right, it was in the social structure. About, yeah. They it's, were talking about PTS. It was more like just that within the structure of the classes, there were right. so many Scientologists who would do FSMing or would take you to an event or would, there was like all this right. sort of private coaching and FSMing going on. So there was a period there where there was a tremendous amount of synergy. Mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. But even at that peak, that was maybe 15% of the students had anything to do with Seinfeld. Right, yeah. There were, it was just, yeah. it was just there were a lot of big ones. Such, yeah, but yeah, that's a lot of people. Uh, the school was huge. 
Ann like Archer, Jason Begay, Jason Begay. It Ann was Archer, Jenna exactly. Elfman, Bodie Elfman, Catherine yeah. Bell. I mean, like big yeah. celebrities. Jeffrey Tambor. Uh, Jeffrey Tambor, of... Giovanni Ribisi. Yeah. Uh, there was a moment there in the late 90s where all of these people were successful at the same time. Very, right. very and much we're Scientologists and we're studying with Milton. And we're studying at the Playhouse. So yeah. that's, uh, I think, Mitch, when you wanted to sort of uh, a reference point. Um, and that carried all the way until about 2003, which is we're getting into the Tom Cruise era where this right. increased puritanical militant style of advocacy for the for Scientology right. kind of took hold. Milton, that pushed Milton away. He was not that kind of guy. Right. He had his own <laughs> ethics in his personal life. He was a single Greek man, highly yeah. charismatic Greek man of a certain age, a certain era they ran their lives a certain way on the on the 2D as we say so he would yeah. get in no, <laughs> notorious trouble because he was such a horn dog let's face it you know what i mean he would just make passes yeah, do, right yeah. left and center i do know. and and, and they when, all tended to look the same they were tall skinny blondes i mean it was like yes milton yeah, had, he a had a type yeah the time and so as the cruise kind of puritanical uh thing took over milton's old school style was pushed aside and not only pushed aside he became a target and they right. uh, by 2003 2004 he was being targeted for his ethics and his out 2d and the right. fact that he didn't right. progress on the bridge right. and he didn't give money and he didn't go to events and he his iconoclastic like i am my own man style mm -hmm. suddenly became in conflict with the new culture there Right. And that's what blew it off. That's what actually blew me out was not so much things that were happening to me, but the things that I observed happening with Milton that I felt were in unjust, unfair, right. extreme. And I ended up being with him in meetings with like these high level ethics people at uh, the AO confronting these like 50 page knowledge reports. You know, people would write knowledge reports is like just a mass like like they were crazy. So I would be kind of his, I don't know, consigliere in these meetings <laughs> at AO. And I was watching these people go insane, crazy. Not that Milton was a prince, but the, the reaction was so extreme uh, that it turned me off. And that was actually right. when I got out right. was long before I even wrote Disconnection or long before right. 2007, 2008, when the blogs and Marty and the, the people were starting right. to get out and t tell people what was going on. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember it got to the point where you were expected if you were an actor, if you were expected to speak out against Milton, that where you could actually get points with ethics for impugning the Beverly Hills playoffs and then enter Grant yeah. Cardone who turned it into oh. a career. Right? And, wasn't yeah. that, and wasn't that sort of, uh, through Elena that that happened yeah. because Elena was an actress who was studying at the Beverly Hills Playhouse, right? Yeah. yeah. And like she, you know, there was like some interaction with her and Milton. Uh, I won't get into that. There was an interaction with her and Milton. Uh, I won't get into one way, two way, all that stuff. I don't yeah, you, that, you know what I mean? That's where I, I know some started that fire with Grant. I, I know Grant. some things. I know some things about that. Um, and but that's what lit the whole Grant Cardone thing on fire. Grant wrote a, an email KR that he then blasted to like a thousand people. <laughs> you know, that was just the shitstorm of shitstorms. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's that's, yes, that's yes, where yes, so the, eventually found, this this sort of this place, the Beverly Hills place, it became this lightning rod for yeah. uh, essentially. And when I was at Gold. Uh, you guys probably knew I was being pulled into whatever ethics was in, in the studio. I was being pulled in and being grilled on Milton. Right. Yeah. So I would come off set and they'd be like, come here. And I'd sit down and be like, what's going on? And there'd be someone Potter. What's her name? Potter, something Potter. Anyway. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I, uh, and she would be like, what's going on with Milton's uh, out ethics on his 2D? And I'd be like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, but I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm just here shooting him movie i'm not responsible for milton's ethics on his 2d or what he's That's doing so in his bedroom crazy. like and she goes well what's going on with Beverly hills playhouse and you know like this very rigid yeah. thing that was pushing me away as well this like the, that rigid prissy thing being pulled right. into ethics right. by like uh, like at cc i'd be pulled in sometimes by like a, a 14 year old ethics officer being right. questioned about the playhouse about milton about my allegiance to milton and this going you know and i just went like ah, you're yeah. 13. 
Like, what is going yeah. on? Here? Yeah, like, the, that's the, when the, I, I start to be like, this is a it's little like nuts. the Twilight Zone. <laughs> You're just yeah, like, for you like, people that are watching, watching you, you people never ends, whatever, you know, true crime watchers or whatever. What you're hearing about is the David Miscavige era of Scientology. Yeah. Like th this is 100% yeah. what is going on with us. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember from the golden era and, and, and the uh, talent, uh, the, you know, the people that dealt with the actors and actresses that there was a guy, I think his name was Mark and he worked at the playhouse as like sort oh. of an ethics officer within yeah, the playhouse. Mark, Mark McPherson. Right, yeah. Mark McPherson. And so, he was getting parts and getting kind of they were putting him into stuff because he was giving us information and he was sort of like the inside guy that was yeah. kind of giving us the real deal of what was going on but then i remember when i was out and seeing like oh no that guy you know these people are still there and they're working are they you know who what their allegiances were or whatever i don't know after i left in 2005 but i do remember yeah that it was just a big mess. And even if we got somebody, if they had been at the playhouse, it was then where it used to be like a, a good thing. It was like, oh no, we can't use that person because they're connected to the right. play. Right. So it kind of was turning into yeah. this thing. Yeah, yeah. And there went all 99% of all the good actors I had to work with. It was really tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'd have to reshoot, right? If like well, someone, yeah, if you know, you know. somebody <laughs> Somebody did something stupid, like made, wrote a play, put on a play called Disconnection. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, but that oh, was. Fuck. I have to reshoot. Well, like, I'd be curious. Like, when did you? When did I become like? Because I think I was declared somewhere. I don't know, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, something like that. I never really. Right. Of course, I never got copied. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you find out because everyone's dump, dumping you on Facebook or something. You know, but. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Right, right. Uh, was there a time where at some point they were like, okay, we got to reshoot the Dianetics thing that like this guy, Alan became a, <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't remember. I imagine I mean, the, uh, well, you know, I was going to say one is a big reshoot. Yeah, we did the, yeah, that. I want to bring up this a, picture real quick, Mitch. I'll bring this up. We yeah, did a film called <laughs> TR 16 beingness. Yeah. And in this oh. film, we had not only these four, which is Jason Begay, Alan Barton there up on the uh, upper right, and then Jeff Pomerantz, who does all the voiceovers for Jeff. us in oh my God. Uh, Scientology different pr uh, productions, the intro. Well, yeah, no, he, he does all the events, if you've ever heard that, that crazy, like, uh, yeah, sure are, are, you, are you ready to rumble? It sounds like the Las Vegas wrestling guy. Yes. Uh, that, that would be him. And then Larry Anderson is there, uh, the last one yeah. in the picture. Right. But you also had in this film... We had um, we had Tate Rupert. We had yep. uh, Jim, oh, Meskin, Tate. Jim Meskin. Jim Meskin. Oh my Meskin. God! These yeah, names. We have Cody Elfman. Was Cody there. Elfman. Carla Zamudio. Um, yep. We had a whole. We basically had the who's who of the Scientology actors that had been in other films. Well, it had yeah. a huge cast. Yeah, we had it in this film as well yeah. in this uh, TR sixteen film. But the film, the thing that you were just talking about with um, the Dianetics video, we shot a, pro, a, a project called the, it was going to be a Dianetics, they called it a documercial because they didn't want to mm -hmm. be, they didn't want to be, be lumped in with the infomercial. Yeah, because market. I had pointed out to David Miscavige, I didn't want to do an infomercial because I thought it was bad positioning for Scientology. And I said, right. you tell me one premium product in existence on planet earth that has ever done an infomercial and you tell me all the products that you really love and admire not one of them ever did an infomercial and so he said okay we're going to do a documercial so, <laughs> so it, it's just an infomercial that's called a documercial really? like a documentary yeah, yeah. and a commercial but but regardless we shot um we shot that and the the host the narrator of that project was grant cardone no and yes and well, so no, yeah, on camera commentator, that's how we met Grant. Yeah, how that is him. how we Grant got him. involved with all of this. Was yeah, and that's how he met Elena. She was cast in a film. And that's where they met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were downtown LA, uh, wow. you know, midnight. We were to shoot, she was in a little vignette. I was sitting in the trailer with Grant. She came walking in to check in with talent. Talent wasn't in there. So she walked up, introduced herself to me. I recognized her. She didn't know me, but I cast her from a headshot because she didn't have yeah. any lines. She just had to slap a dude and walk away. Remember, we shot that kind of shit all the time. Just slap him, yeah. you know, it's for Dianetics. And and so Grant went like monosyllabic when he saw her. He was like, ah. Yeah. 
And then he he right. said to me, oh, you have to introduce me to her. And I'm like, I'm not going to pimp for you. You can she's on the set. Go meet, introduce yourself. So anyway, that's that's how that whole thing happened. Wow. So but, but so we shot that whole thing, and David Miscavige didn't want to use Grant. We had to basically sell him on using Grant, and then we shot the whole thing. And with him, we shot all these different uh, where he just narrates and introduces a scene. And one of those was the session where we show how to do this session. Now, right. the actress who came to be in that session was was going to be it was just it was a two shot or it was just two two actors, yeah. um, this girl and then Sydney shares oh, facing each yeah. other. Yeah. And they had to do a Dianetics auditing session. Well, that girl had been up all night with Grant <laughs> the night before. It was Grant. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and boy, I didn't know it was Grant. Yeah, he was yeah. bragging about it in the morning when he came into the the lounge and the talent lounge and the perfect. castle. He was yeah, like, "That's perfect." He was yeah. like, "Oh, I, you yeah. know, I had to use up a whole bottle of Viagra," and he's telling all this stuff, and we're just like, "Are you an insane person?" Like, we have to. And shoot that's the guy him. who writes a, a KR on Milton. Yes, yeah. and we had to okay, shoot. He wasn't married yet, but, but that's yeah. whatever. But yeah, but he was. But but because we had to shoot with her, he she literally didn't know any of her lines. And to me, yeah. it was kind of wild because Alan would do his lines and then he would do her lines and then she would just parrot back her lines to Alan. Yeah, so we had to, we, we cut around everything, but Alan just uh, from memory that, yeah this this yeah. part to me was i you <laughs> yeah. went you went up so many levels as, a, as an actor to be alan because oh, yeah you did all yeah. of your lines i remember the crew all of her lines that was like a day where the crew i earned a certain level of respect with the crew i remember i like oh, no, because I, I got along you, you, with everyone but saving that yeah. shoot on that day by by doing yeah, her because lines the, and the thing it figuring gold. out a way to yeah, so the thing at Gold, this actress, who, by the way, I had gotten her into Scientology, and she used to work for me. She was a really good friend of mine. She was, she had been one of the girls that was brought into audition as Tom Cruise's potential girlfriend, and blah blah blah. And uh, and I never knew about this. I thought, oh, poor girl. You know, sometimes this happens to an actor, right, Alan? They're just having the worst day, yeah. and they can't remember anything. And I thought, oh, I've got to help her out. What am I going to do? Plus, at Gold, everybody gets in trouble. The, if yeah. we can't get through that day. If we can't figure out a way to solve it, they're not going to blame it on her. They're yeah. going to blame it on everybody. And they're going to blame it a lot on Mark because he's running the group. So yeah, right. he's really going to get it big yeah. time. So That's we had to come up. My, if, I just remember Alan saving my ass that day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He did all of her so lines. Like, I was like, so this, I, I this guy's our secret Alan, you're gonna, We're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, so we handed him the script and like read her her line. So he would say, hello, how are you? How are you doing today? How's it going? And she would say, hello, how are you? How are you doing today? How's it going? And he would say, fine. And then we would cut it together. It, yeah. came out, it was great. So, it was, it, it, yeah, you couldn't tell that that's how no, it that was put together no, at all. No, it was amazing. But Truly in the amazing. end, none of that footage, none of that stuff ever became a project. And they, no, we never got released. Well, but just for no. clarification, just, just to be historically accurate about this, everything we shot with Grant was thrown out. All yes. the other stuff was then incorporated into other projects. Everything yes, we used things. all of that footage in B-roll or yeah, in but scene Grant, another Grant thing that it, yeah. it could work. Yeah. But yeah. the Grant footage never, ever saw the light no. of day. No, and no, somewhere, not for anything. Yeah, and somewhere there is a whole thing of Grant being the front guy for Scientology mm. and Dianetics yeah. and being this thing. And the, and the craziest part of it is that David Miscavige didn't like him because he came off as like a, like a swarm. Swarmy, 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 yeah. He's just like a, like a used car salesman, for, yeah, yeah, like a thug, perhaps. kind of a thug, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but the so the amazing thing is, not long before I left Scientology, I was at Scientology Media Productions, and I got a letter from David Miscavige, and he said that okay, so I did this thing with a writer, this woman that used to work with us, and she and I wrote this thing, right? Mm -hmm. She was with us on the set all the time when we were shooting Grant. She had a massive crush on Grant, right? And it was kind of silly but um so apparently grant had gone to miscavish years later and said he'd warned the writer this woman that it wasn't going to work and that we were just like kidding ourselves he lied to him this is was a total fiction like he never he he never told her that because he was never with her when i wasn't there 
Hmm. You know what it was like? Because we were always on the set together. So he, it, to ingratiate himself with Miscavige, he told this lie about, well, you know, the thing, I told the writer that it wasn't going to work. And then I know that Miscavige believed it because he wrote me and said the person's name. You know, uh, Grant told me that he warned her that that wasn't going to work. And I was, anyway, fortunately, yeah. this it was towards the my final days there. And it, it, there was so much crap going on. But, but yeah, so anyway, that's that's our somehow we managed to work in a Grant Cardone story. But. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, because he crossed so many different paths. Well, yeah. And with yeah. the Playhouse, these... he really was a villainous talk to oh, character. Man. He was the he worst. Just... Yeah. 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 And he was doing it also just to ingratiate himself, to make himself look good. He was just going to tear these yeah. people apart, which is, you know. Yeah. Sort of serve Milton on a platter for him. Yeah. 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 His own yeah. psychopathic, narcissistic gain. It was just not a good guy. Yeah. The other so, shoot yeah. I wanted to ask you about, Alan, was we did a what we called uh, well, it was, it was a trailer for one of these films, oh. and we shot it on Hollywood Boulevard, uh, right where they Scientology has a, the the Hollywood Test Center, the big right. Uh, right. building yeah. right near uh, Hollywood and uh, Highland yeah. that's got the Scientology uh, sign down the side mm -hmm. of it. And um, it was it was a trailer for the film PC Indicators, and right. what was supposed <laughs> to happen is there's supposed to be this. <laughs> this gunman oh, man. who's yeah. up in up in the building and he's either got hostages or he's i don't remember yeah. the premise but he's got a gun and he's shooting at everybody and there's not all just these, a gun he's got a an ak an ak-47 he's got a machine a gun i don't think we're supposed to say that word we say pew pew um oh, pew -pew, mm -hmm. right he's pew -pew. got a pew pew and um, a russian and designed pew pew <laughs> And um, he's supposed to shoot at a bunch of the cop cars, and we had like uh, pyro uh, squibs, you know, to make the the bullets fire and all this other stuff. But we were supposed to do this starting like right when it got dark. And of course, in 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 true golden era shoot crew style, we weren't mm -hmm. exactly ready at that time. No, <laughs> I was <laughs> like, it was midnight, one in the morning. I want to say, yeah, we were shooting off these pew pews, these uh, fully automatic pew pews in the middle of the night with blanks. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. but it, I remember it being very loud. But um, wh what were you in that? You were like a reporter. Or I was a, a, a reporter or someone who didn't understand what was going on. So someone comes up like the, the Scientologist or the person who knows about indicators, like says something. I, I just remember because this was the audition, like, yeah, you, know, you got to look at the guy's skin tone. And my response was like, skin tone yeah like, so I, I, what the f are you talking about you know and uh, that was the audition was skin tones you know yeah. and for years after that like people would come up to me at cc and be like skin tone there you go <laughs> you know yeah. like it was just one of yeah. those yeah. readings that you, yeah that, yeah <laughs> that i mean yeah i think i think the setup was there was a hostage negotiator yeah that was using scientology technology to try to evaluate the guy's emotional state exactly and so they could talk him down of course the whole thing was horribly bad and you were the kind <laughs> so of I was the lead relief. hostage negotiator and some guy who yeah. knows about pc indicators is talking to me and saying right. no, you gotta look at the guy's skin tone i'm like <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness the, and the other thing really that was an early gig for me too that was like uh one of the like second or third or something like that i was still sort of getting my sea legs on uh, yeah. Yeah. what the vibe was yeah, yeah, one of the other reasons why I remember that because it was a night shoot and we would set up during the day and then we would shoot at night and then we would sleep in Los Angeles and then the next day we'd drive back up to the right. desert to Golden Air Productions. Right. And one of the crew was in trouble. He was a camera guy and he had gotten in trouble because some shot was out of focus or something happened or it was a bad camera move. And, um, and he was supposed to get interrogated at Gold. So mm -hmm. he told us in the morning, he said, hey, I got to go back to gold to go get interrogated. And there's a special shuttle that'll to take people like at times. So then we were setting up for the shoot and then we shot all night. And then the next morning, somebody said, hey, blah, 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 blah needs to come to, to get sec checked right after you guys are done with the shoot. And we're like, he went yesterday to do that. And then we were like, uh oh, he got his blue. He got a 24 hour head start. He gone. <laughs> <laughs> and no He's halfway to the Arizona border. <laughs> and no one has ever heard from that guy ever. Like, yeah. He literally yeah. disappeared into the ether. And I've I've asked people about him, you know, since I left in 2005. But yeah, no. So whenever we did that shoot, uh, we lost somebody. And then that ended up, you know, then we had to it, all kinds of other nonsense happens when so, when one of the crew kind of escapes during a location yeah, shoot. who gets busted for the for the fact that an escape happened is that you or well that one was, 
he vent- no no i would not get in trouble Mitch, because you you were you, you were never like Steor, right yeah i, I mean do- well the other thing is they're not going to yank me into ethics because that means they have to shut shooting down yeah. So, you know, they can get another cameraman or whatever, but yeah. I was the only guy who could run the crew, direct a set. So it was like, right. I, right. I could get away with a lot. And I did. So I, I'm pretty, I pretty sure I'm the one who got in trouble <laughs> yeah, for that yeah. because he was, on, he was in, yeah. I was over grip, lighting, and camera were my direct Sea yeah. Org members yeah. that I was responsible for, even though I was also responsible for makeup and costume and props and everything else. Yeah. But, yeah. but the, organizationally, uh, grips, camera, and lighting were directly under me. So if a camera person escaped, yeah, he was your guy, Mark. Yeah. And you should have seen it coming. God damn it. You should have yeah. seen it coming. I know. I didn't. You know what I didn't yeah. see? I didn't see the indicators. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't see his skin tone. I couldn't tell yeah. what his skin, skin tone, tone Mark. Skin tone. He was. He was well, GTO. you know, Alex, since you mentioned the, the, the I guess, buzz phrase. That is a fra- that is a thing. The catchphrase, I guess, like you, the catchphrase for you from that ad was skin tone, right? It became like a catchphrase. Yeah. People would come up to you and they'd say, it. "That's one of the things that Mark and I have been uh, discussing on the show." Is the number of catchphrases yes. within Scientology that came out of these films? You know, like I duplicated oh, sure. utterly. Mark did one. He came in a room. And he said, "Wrong room." People would do that all the time. There's a bunch of them, but you also had another one in that being this film. And I'm trying to remember what it was is. Was it the four? Yeah, the four. Yeah, it was with the. Yeah, yeah do you remember? Could I just that? have. Uh, what is it? Uh, two more days? Uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, like. Uh, yes. Like, because he's always wanting more time, if I remember. Yeah. And I would be yeah. like, I need just one more day. Just one more day. Yeah. You know, yeah. like he was so neurotic. He was so yeah. overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. That was like you... a big deal getting that. I remember reading uh, like LRH advices or whatever yeah. they call them like pages of him talking about this character that they couldn't yeah. cast at yeah. the time he was making these movies <laughs> yeah yeah well, that's another yeah. key thing I, I didn't even we should bring that up in that tr16 being this film l ron hubbard is coaching these people on how yeah. they're supposed to do this. i had to have scenes with him yeah and so we had a body well with well, hold on not with him but we had a with a voice yeah. We had we Something. had a, a a body actor that we shot from behind because that's yeah. what Hubbard instructed it to. Stupidest yeah. thing in the world. And then we had <laughs> we had a uh, a voice. Uh, you know, we were never supposed yeah. to say impersonator. We were supposed yeah. to say, and then we had an actor portray his voice. It was a portrayal because obviously, as any actor knows, there's a difference between an impersonation and a portrayal. So yeah. Yeah. so anyway, but basically we. Have, did the best we could to impersonate L. Ron Hubbard from behind. Yeah. And just as another callback, the guy that we used most of the time to do the body double <laughs> back then, for yeah. L. Ron Hubbard back yeah. then, mm-hmm. yeah, was the guy that blew on that shoot in Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, <guy>. that's right. <laughs> so on this on this film, we had to get an outside. This guy. film, we had a real big guy that yeah. really matched L. Ron Hubbard exactly. Yeah, like, they just they, died I remember his hair. we had. Yeah, we had to do all these hair tests to send him a scavenge of the back of this guy's, like the moles right. on his neck right. and his hair and his ears. And they were comparing, forensically comparing those yeah. to the back yeah. of Holman Hubbard's head. Yeah, and, and the scavenge, sure he, he was really concerned, remember Mark, with uh, Hubbard apparently had very thick wrists and yes. long, long, skinny fingers. So this was like, whoa, this is a big deal. Nope, fingers are too short. Nope, wrists are too thin. No, it was just... It was, it was nice. never ending to find a guy who matched L. Ron yeah, Hubbard right. from back. So, and and he didn't, all he did was move. That's it. He would do like, there was hand movements and then there was head shakes and there was nods. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that was really yeah. it. And it was, was like, crazy. this is the hardest part is just getting yeah. something to look like him. Not even the other stuff. And pretty much anybody we get can do it. Yeah. I don't know if it's worth talking about the, con- the actual concept of that film, but it's based on a true story that Hubbard had actually himself trained all of these auditors up to a certain level and they all were horrible. Uh, and so his, his, his solution for that was to explain to them that maybe it was their attitude, that maybe when they were auditing, they had the wrong attitude and maybe they needed to take a little bit of time and think about their attitude and think about what and who they were trying to be. It's really a mind fuck mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Totally. And, and, and so a, a messenger had recorded this lecture in real life, and then Hubbard took it and he wrote it into a, this fictionalized version. And it's a crazy film. It's just because he just gaslit all these people 
into thinking the reason that his his ridiculous technology didn't work was because they had the wrong <laughs> that they had the wrong attitude. You just had the wrong so, attitude. Yeah. So <laughs> oh, I remember that being a very large scale film. Like it, it wasn't yeah, that it, like sort of like to finally shoot TR sixteen was oh, like yeah, a big, big deal. It yeah. was a huge deal. Big deal. I think it, it, yeah. I think it was yeah. also one of the last few ones that had never, ever been yeah, shot. never been done. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's I remember there was something about it. It was like, well, one yeah, of maybe that was the one that we the completed. One. Yeah, we completed the tech films the first time we completed them. And that's then we exactly all got, what I was we all got it was also the last one that yeah. had to be done. It was that yeah, no, we, we did the, all of them when we'd finished that one. They were all done for the very first time in right. history, even though they'd all be yeah. multiple times get redone. But yeah. like that one, they got a, like a quite. They gave you a week off and sent you to a nice. Uh, no, 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 no. They gave us Letterman <laughs> jackets and patches. <laughs> That they, oh, that they took that they kept for me when I escaped. They said, "No, we're not giving you that jacket." <laughs> I have. I, and I have remember my, that one. That film you only get to see at a very high level, and I couldn't even. I wasn't even at the level to see the film. And I remember, yeah. I think I got to see it on the ship. I was down yeah, there think, for something, yeah. and then and I got to it. see it there, like in yeah. a small room, and it was me and Jeff. Yeah. And we got to. They sort of snuck one by because technically yeah. I wasn't at high enough. To level up to see it. the movie that I just been in. Yeah, <laughs> like I know the movie, guys. I was in it. Yeah, yeah. So the was Jeff. <laughs> there was. I remember there being an issue about whether I could see the movie. That's like, so I just acted yeah. the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. There's a lot of strange, weird stuff like that. So. Yeah. The what was the movie we did where there was it was a kitchen setup and things were falling oh, apart in oh, the kitchen? Oh, that was with um. Marianna. That was with Mariana as well. With Mariana, you that was change the, stop. Yeah, when we did start. Oh, out. yes, we covered. That was that like film. when I'd go to the refrigerator and the handle came off. Yes, I shot that film, like, shot that film three times. <laughs> I did. It was the first film I did when I went to Gold. Then I shot it again with you, and then after you mm -hmm. left, I shot it again with Jack Armstrong <laughs> and oh, Jack. Uh, Jack. Remember Jack? His name. Yeah, I, sh I shot it. I thought it was. I shot it with Jack Armstrong, and I forget who played. His uh, anyway, I wrote about that film because it was quintessentially the script contained Hub Hubbard's really misogynistic view of women's role in society. Yeah. It really was, you know, this woman, she was accident prone, she was like ditzy, and mm -hmm. she wasn't fulfilling her role of taking care of the man. And it, this is kind of subtle in the film. Like I didn't even realize on it when I was making it, how much it was based on his sort of very fifties misogynistic view of a woman's role in life was basically to care for a household, which is something he had written about. And, and, and that, you know, when a society yeah. fails to do that, they're on their way out and blah, blah, blah. So we made a whole film about, Oh, you know, it was, uh, it was, yeah, maybe I'm confused. I don't know, but it was you were did in Marianne Elliott do it twice. I guess she was because the the time I did it with Jack was with Marianne Elliott. Yeah, so, oh, so she she did a role again. Yeah, for but, the new me. Yeah, exactly. No, but wait a minute. But you because but you played the role of the husband, right? Yeah. Yeah, you were the husband. So, but you were in the one with Jack Armstrong as the he was the auditor. Oh, was he the auditor? Oh, maybe he maybe was. that was it. About this yeah, Jack was the Maybe auditor. we're all... <laughs> this yeah, is we're, us. We're like, three different things. In terms of yeah, no, but maybe I only <laughs> shot it twice then. Maybe because that second time, you were the husband who called the auditor. Jack was the auditor. Marianna yeah. was the... Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of a joke. You want to be the husband or you want to be the wife? Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, okay, so we did that film. What was another one that we did? We did... I'm because I remember shooting. We did you ever shoot at those studios in Hollywood where we were doing um e meter films? Did you ever do any of that? Were you around during that? Was like early, so. that was like mid 90s, like 90 that, was like, when, that was actually when Jason came in, yeah, yeah, because we first met Jason in in, in Hollywood and you know, in Sunland, we were in some, yeah, some place, and yeah. he was, but at least he got to shoot like the studio. That was, was like I shot something at AO with you guys, and but but a ton of teasers, like stuff for the events. Yeah, yes. Like I feel like half of the stuff I shot for you was like a teaser for the events. That they were right. still fun. But I remember Mitch, you and I going to get Mexican food up on Hollywood Boulevard because yeah. there was some pro <laughs> some problem with the setup or they weren't ready, and you were just like, "Come on, man, let's go, eat. let's let's go eat." And I was like, "Huh, huh." <laughs> the director is asking me to go eat. You know. Yeah, so yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I yeah that, was a, that was a move that Mitch would do. I always thought he was doing that to to shield the actors from the horrible food that we were going to possibly get. Well, I was. <laughs> and so he would be like, hey, let's go grab it. And it was always, if there was chips and salsa within 100 feet of Mitch. Yeah, would, I would find it. Yeah. Like a little radar that goes off. So yeah, would I, I would like, absolutely hey. find it. I am a true Angelino, not born here, but raised here. So the food, the food went up uh, when you got to the castle. I remember, they seem to remember the food quality. Oh yeah, the food was well, yeah. Okay. We did, we, when we were at Norton, we had to get whatever food they'd make the food the night before, and they'd put it in these like metal trays. And then when we'd leave <laughs> like in the morning, atrium. we'd grab it. Yeah, we'd just grab it and bring it out there, and it was sort of like uh, you know, it was a surprise what we were going to get. Most of the time, it was. Uh, what I used to affectionately call rainbow beef and sweaty cheese because it had been sitting in these things for, you know, 12 hours by the time it yeah. would get to lunchtime or whatever it was. And so, Perfect. It, yeah, to me, it, that yeah. was always my most embarrassing sort of aspect of shooting with people outside of the bubble. Like sometimes we'd get mm -hmm. Scientology actors and that would be horrible, but sometimes we'd get just actors that didn't know anything about Scientology. And I would always yeah. think, this is the worst representation of yeah, like, sure. these people have all this money, but they're not going to spend 80 bucks on lunch for somebody. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And also there was the motorhome issue. We would go on location and they wouldn't necessarily provide, you know, this is when I, you know, uh, coined the term of, you know, Starbucks America's de facto restroom. So, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, so, but I don't know if you remember. Well, this there was that whole, Issue with SAG too. Remember, uh, like there was yes. the, the big moment of like, was Golden Era gonna do a SAG contract? I seem to remember that was being a fairly significant like. Yeah, well, we the gold, we're really yeah. gonna get paid. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, yeah, that was a real problem because well, you remember what's her name, Shauna Breakfield, right? Did you you knew Shauna? She was married to Tate Rupert. Did you ever know? Her? Yeah, I knew Tate well, but and I knew yeah, her yeah. so. She's not, they haven't been married in years and she's no longer, hasn't been a Scientology for years. As a matter of fact, she testified He's, on behalf of Paul Haggis. Tate still in? I don't know. I'm not hearing from him. I was. He was such a, he was such a good guy and I'm sure he still is. I mean, I say was because these people are like from some, another chapter in my life. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. He's back yeah. East because his wife, mm -hmm. his, his ex-wife and his daughter moved back there and he wanted to be close to them. I know he was struggling yeah. financially and painting houses and stuff, which is mm -hmm. kind of a because he's a good actor, but Shauna was in charge of, she used to work for SAG. She was a Scientologist who worked for SAG and she used to work for the, uh, the indie department, the indie, the part of SAG that is trying to make deals with independent filmmakers. Like, so at least they can capture that, you know, they can work mm. with that sector. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we worked with Shauna and she actually did this deal, which is how SAG, which is how gold could, could be a signatory. They could hire SAG actors, but they could mix the SAG actors with staff members who were extras, only yeah. extras, not speaking parts. Because the idea was, is that those Scientology staff members are not taking work away from right. anybody in the, in the, in the guild. Uh, but, and then of course they could always do independent work, which we mostly tried to do, but sometimes we yeah. would do a, yeah. a SAG contract because you know, it's like, when I redid the film Jason was in, I had to spend a lot of money to get mm. decent actors. You know, we, we were going up you know, the thousands of dollars a day, day, you know, kind of fee for people. Cause I, you know, they learned the lesson that, you know, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Um, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, didn't, it, didn't it evolve to a certain point, Mitch, though, where they weren't using Scientologists as actors at all? At all, and you were only using non Scientologists because you right. kept having to redo right. things because every yeah, Scientologist so would be declared like, like that. Was an amazing sort of like a circuitous bit of logic that they yeah. got to the point of having to not use Scientologists because if the Scientologists left, yeah. they'd have to reshoot. Because God forbid you see a person on up there who maybe is not as if someone viewing the thing would know or not know, but um. Well, they would. I think they would have known who Jason Begay was. I guess within, yes. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, but even more, I think even more cogently is the idea that we're going to clear the planet except for enough people to be in our films. Yes, yeah. we don't want Scientologists in our films, so we're always going to leave enough people out there. Just you know, it's just such. I want to ask book. you guys about because in your book, sure. Mitch, I was so astonished, and I can't remember if it's in yours as well, Mark, and maybe it is, and I can't remember. Forgive me, but Lisa. 
Oh yeah, I wrote about I that. remember that was the biggest one of the big shocks to me because on set I remember liking her a lot. When she was your assistant, Mitch, yeah. or your yeah. first AD, she seemed like as genuine as Mark or Sadie or John or like any of these people, yeah. like the makeup people, the there was the Southeast Asian one and then the redhead and like yeah. all, there were all these persons. Sarni and Sam. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Who were so great. I really, really enjoy them. And Lisa was one of them. Yeah. Well, they and had, I, they were all happy. They had, most, a great, they had the best jobs in the Sea Org. I don't know. But <laughs> it was, mean, that was the most Mark, astonishing. I mean, yeah, Lisa. To see that Lisa was the sort of the monster that you clearly portray, and I, I'm sure yeah. it's uh, an accurate portrayal. But that yeah. one, was, I was like, "Whoa!" I can tell yeah. you that I, Mike I, Render read my book, and uh, he graciously also did some some fact checking on the manuscript. And one of the notes I got back from him was, "You nailed Lisa." So. Yeah, the description no. of Lisa is the most comprehensive description of this person that you could have and yeah. easily. Yeah. Go. But to answer, to really yeah. answer your, to answer your question, Alan, uh, it, it was, she hadn't, Miss Cabbage hadn't fully gotten a hold of her and turned her into a monster because he yeah. has a way of doing this. I mean, she went from my being my assistant, not an assistant AD, but director's assistant uh, to being the commanding officer of golden era productions and to working as a protege of David Miscavige and who yeah. then threw her in the hole. Yeah. And, you know, you've all heard the horrible story about being Debbie Cook being put in a barrel of ice water and having yeah. a sign put on her that says Lesbo. Well, that would have been Lisa who had the sign around her neck. So you like, know, that's just, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, it's why I, I, I can't conceive that this cool person who would like give me smokes and we, you know, cause you and, yeah. you and her would like go have a smoke on a break. Yeah. yeah. Like all the time. Like there's yeah. like 100 cigarettes. She was funny. She was funny, but she was a, she was in a great spot then. Cause she'd been busted yeah. up and she was what Mark? She was the, uh, she was in charge of CMO the, in, she was, yeah, no, she was in charge of got, ethics in CMO. Yeah, she was mm -hmm. over the HCO, which is like the yeah. Ethics she was like an HCO chief CMO. Yeah, yeah, and she'd been the receptionist in CMO. Blah blah. Then she got mm -hmm. busted, and then when they, I was overworked. I needed assistance, so they somehow her handling. They, you know, I don't know. They, we well, got so much of the trash, but she, I, think I was going to say in 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 the C organization at the Int Base, Golden Era Productions is the lowest you can be. So that's I was literally about to make that point. Was that's something that I learned after the fact because uh, yeah, as right. an actor coming in and you get the clearances and you get the directions and can you go and the thing and then this and then that you feel as though you're like at the top, man. Yes. Like. They're yeah. like right across the street there. You're at the bottom it's of the all top. happening. The studio and the thing and the musicians yeah. and the, you know, you're at the top of the, I mean, you know, and then afterwards to read the books and you go like, yeah. gold was like, the, kick them to the trash. Kick yes. them across yeah. The well, except, the except, except, but, but wait a minute, but except for look. Miscavige, but for Miscavige, <laughs> the ultimate is for you. If you're a high up executive and now you're the assistant to the director. Mm -hmm. On the shoot team. Oh, that's a there's big not deal. there's i mean they, they a lot of those guys if it, they were males they would have been put in the grounds department as a d weeder yeah. or but if we have a person that could be this assistant person who's personable and yeah. she could interact with mitch the, it's still a punishment though because of yeah. she, she was because of who she was, she was to be that right, but, but wouldn't you say mark but wouldn't you say that yes if a toilet backs up at gold yeah. Or if a sprinkler breaks, or if you need a light bulb or a fuse change, you've got to call an engineer from gold. You call gold because gold supplied all the support services for the whole base, including yeah. food, including lodging. Like they were responsible for all that. But the shoot crew, I mean, Miscavish spent millions on that castle and lavished us with equipment as long as we were producing lots of work. The shoot crew was its own rarefied bubble. That's like, true. You're feeling that, Alan. You're feeling like you hit the top. You know, you were at the top. In in that environment, it was right because we I didn't were like have his pet I didn't call project. Any, we were David Miscavige's yeah. pet project. So yeah, yeah that's that's I definitely the vibe call, I got. Yeah, yeah, because I didn't call anybody from CMO Int or RTC, sir. I wasn't expected to. I never. I didn't yeah. even call Miscavige, sir. Uh, yeah. It made me feel uncomfortable. I'm like, why am I calling this guy, sir? It's like weird. You know, yeah. I, I, it's like whatever. So, but whatever. But I think that's it. Yeah. But it is very much outside. Once you set outside the castle, 
that's the like when that's like uh, you're at Harvard and then you, that's the janitorial department. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's, the, that's a funny thing that you mentioned that, Mitch, because yeah. because the castle was so far away from everything else. Right. People wouldn't go there from if out on the property. Like if you didn't work there, there'd be no reason. Yeah, to that's leave. true. So you didn't we just kind of got left pay. alone just based on yeah. the location. It was just too far to go. Yeah, too far to give you shit. Reason. Yeah. yeah, we were like 800 yards away from the closest facility yeah. out yeah. there. So yeah, it was pretty far. And the other thing was, is if David Miscavige did go to the castle, which he did on a pretty regular basis, yeah. if he was yeah. at the property, he wanted to see what was yeah. going on over there. I met and him there so, a couple times. Yeah. 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 So if you were at the castle and you weren't supposed to be, and he was there, you were toast. Like you, you yeah. could be in really oh, big trouble. Yeah. So it was sort of like we had a little force field, but at the same time, David Miscavige was in there with us. So it was, we were protected from the rest of the property, but not him. So, um, yeah. you know, it was all sorts of nonsense. And they, the funniest thing is even after we built that place, that's where we packaged almost all of the Scientology basic books and compact. Oh, discs and well, I remember shooting there. Well, I, maybe it was on TR 16 when every hallway, Yes, Which I think the circumference of the castle is like a mile. Probably, uh, you know, uh, all those all tables. <laughs> like, so I've got to tell you this: you you might be the first person that's been out in the wild who's ever seen that because that was that was how well, David Miscavige was justifying that the all of the L. Ron Hubbard policies and all of the L. Ron Hubbard bulletins are not right because yeah. they're out of order and there's right. things that shouldn't right. be. And so they could never ever look at everything. And so he had this bright idea. Why don't you print out every single thing that L. Ron Hubbard ever wrote yeah. and put it in order? And they it kept trying to do it. And, and it took the circumference of the castle to do they, it. Well, like, but actually, the, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't big enough. That whole yeah. thing is moved. <laughs> To a warehouse that looks like the end, the ending of uh, Indiana Jones, the, the original one. <laughs> yeah, literally, it's in a warehouse. Men. Yeah, and the thing is, is that Miscavige has this delusion that if he lays out in date order everything that Hubbard ever did, he'll be able to figure out the the sort of magic key that will make it all work, and it's never going to work. Like why it hasn't worked yet? Yeah, because yeah. what Hubbard wrote was just. Yeah, this they're is, always finding some key yeah. piece of information yeah. that's unlocking I remember, everything. <laughs> I, I remember very early on, you know, again, I got in because, I mean, I found a lot of his stuff uh, uh, legitimately interesting. And I have, I, I have the kind of brain that'll read a thousand page book like Dianetics or, you know, the tone scale thing. And, it, you know, um, and, uh, but I remember early on at one of the events, like I would go to the CC events, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 10, 10 x 12 x 20 x 30 x you know and then i'd be there the next year and i remember asking someone i got like a really evil look i forget who i asked staff member or somebody and i was like but if it was 20 x last year and it's 30 x this year the parking lot you need a new parking lot you need like five new parking lots right like that doesn't make any sense to me you know, I, I was saying that in like 1998 i was like if it was but i was here last year and it said 10 x yeah, and he, this year it's twenty x. The cognitive like distance has yeah. to be very like, strong to keep you. In where that are all those people? Nice. And some yeah. of those it's never ten x where you are, Alan. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. somewhere, somewhere else. Ten x in Tanzania. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And a lot of times, it literally, it literally would be in an organization. They got one person clear last year. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. this year they got ten got people 10. clear. So yeah. it's 10 X, but they don't say, well, yeah, but it was, was not even really one. Cause that guy that got cleared, he was already cleared before. He just was, somebody told me he wasn't. Like everyone do their student hat. Again. It's new yeah. stats. Look at the stats. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. a lot of people, they lost a lot of people on that, that whole, that whole yeah. routine, making them do stuff over. But it's amazing the people they, they did lose. I mean, it's like, one particular person I'm thinking of who happens to be married to Jim Eskimen, she was on solo knots longer than anybody I knew, maybe 10 years. And she do every she did every iteration of it. Just when it would finish, the new one would mm, come out. They would come out a new one. Just when it would finish. And she some people they just persevere. They're they're so <laughs> hardwired into that community and that ideology. And you know, and and the thing is you have paid to have it 
to accept a false identity for yourself. I mean, that's a pretty serious thing. You know, the fact that you're a spiritual being, that you live for all these years, that you were in this cataclysmic, you know, cosmic galactic disaster and that you're infested with body thetans and all this stuff. You've accepted this over time as your identity. So in order to change that and the more of that you do, and you've also paid for it. So yeah, the sunk cost. Uh, yeah. Issue. yeah but, yeah, but it's it's not it's it's, it's not only huge. yeah that is big, but it's also it's this idea that you really don't know who you are. I mean, I struggled with this because you've so accepted this fictional uh, identity, and and you know your story of who you are. That's the most important thing you have, and so you've now paid money to have this fake one, and when you, it can be really devastating to say, "I know that's bullshit," but who the hell am I? I mean, it's like I struggle. I have a lot of issues. So when when you yeah. were when you were um, talking about earlier, you saw this and this was kind of the thing. And was there one thing if you could isolate that or, or, or just one one piece of information or a story or something that kind of t pushed you over the edge? Like, what was that thing that you just said? Oh, I, yeah. For you, Alan, that you were like, I, I'm not going to be in this anymore. Like, what the, was the um, I want to make sure I'm not glitching. <clears throat> Are you there? Yeah, we're now here. we're good. Now we're good. Okay, cool. Um, I saw you. I got the spinning wheel. Um, what did it for me was the this jihad against Milton in the mm. school because he was a teacher, mentor, uh, a friend, depending on the day. Um, <laughs> given that there's four years difference between sure, us and yeah, all that, yeah, but yeah. I was I, I was the guy really helping him run the school by that time was fairly high up in the management. Um, and it was the way they were treating him and these insane, uh, I remember uh, a, a big moment for me was the famous Tom Cruise meritorious uh, giganticus, whatever award he got <laughs> that and that speech he gave, which, which became very famous. I didn't go to that event, but then I watched it later. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking there was sort of this thing of like, you either get on the train or you, whatever it was. You're either on the team and or you're not. I remember telling someone at the playhouse, I can't remember, I said, I watched that event and I said, I'm going to get off your train because I don't like you. And I don't like your attitude. And I don't like the vibe. So I'm getting off the train. But Milton, you know, but I did it quietly because Milton was still in. Mm -hmm. He was still seeking a uh, connection with CC. I think he was personally hurt by the people who were coming after him and losing Jenna Elfman, who I think he felt a, a real kinship to as a student and someone who became successful under his guidance. And I was very, my allegiance was really first to him and to the school yeah. and Scientology was way down on the list. And, um, and I had met my, now my wife of 20 years, but we were dating back then. And she was raising some flags that at the time I was like, oh my God, is this a problem? Is this a person for me? I don't know. Should I find someone else? Should I be? <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, but it was more right. like she, she was kind of like that person that I was in a certain way going, but if it was 10X last year, 20X <laughs> this year, how come the parking lot's empty? Right. She would ask that question and I'd get ornery about something else. Mm -hmm. but, and, but I was smart enough to be listening. And so all those things kind of led me to be like, you know what? I think I'm done with this. There was a demand at one point that uh, there was one. There were these two students, brother and sister, Manjimelo, Man, Man, Mangelo, something. And uh, their mother was declared, and she was a woman who would show up at events with placards like "Scientology is bad." And they were students at the school, and we got pulled in, or I got pulled in, on behalf of Milton to be given an order that these two kids had to be thrown out of the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Because their mother held up a sign at an event, and if we didn't throw those, these two kids, who were perfectly good students of ours, if we didn't throw them out of the school because of their connection to their mother, because they wouldn't disconnect from her, and we had to disconnect from them, then they would disallow every other Scientologist at the school from doing anything in Scientology, wow. down to CC, all those people would be kicked off their a kickoff lines or whatever you could call it because the playhouse didn't sever its connection to two young kids whose mom was, I just went, no, no, this is wrong. It, it just finally hit that moment for me. And this is probably 2001, 2002, where I just went, I'm done. 
I can't do this. Wow. But it was another 10 years before they messed. Do you remember Mario Feninger? Yes, I was going to say. Well, yeah. This became the one. story that, of my play, yeah. which is that he was my piano teacher and he was a very tolerant, genial man. Mm. Didn't care that I was in, out, was willing to talk about anything. Very old school, old and old school. And, but he was always in financial straits and I was helping him out. I was just helping him pay his bills. You know, he was 90 something years old. He needed help. And at some point they told him that they, he had to return those checks from me because I was still affiliated with the playhouse or Milton or whatever. And that was the one that turned me from kind of passively uh, inactive yeah. to, okay, fuckers, uh, <laughs> now you're going to hear from me. Yeah. And that's when I got in contact with Marty Rathbun because he had posted something about Milton and that whole story. And I was like, I yes. know all about that. And yeah. Then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And that whole thing with Mario, when he told me that he was pulled in by ethics and could no longer, not only not accept my help, could no longer see me as a student or as a friend because of the, I just, that just pissed me off so bad. Right. Yeah. And that, right. but I remember driving around going, that's actually a good idea for a play. How mm. poignant is that to interfere with a teacher student relationship, which is right. a very strong relationship right. when you've right. got the right, right. combo. It's very yeah. powerful. Especially when you're talking about something like music. Yeah. It makes it all the more and, powerful. And to, and to take this guy who was 90 something and basically couldn't pay his electricity and deny him the help because yeah. I wasn't cool with something they had done 10 years prior. This yeah. was really unfolded over a long time. Yeah. Um, that's when I became sort of more agitated, which then yeah. got declared because then I was in, what's his name, interviewed me for the book, Going Clear. I'm in that Lawrence book. Wright. He interviewed Lawrence me. Wright, yeah. Lawrence Wright interviewed me for that book. That got me in trouble. You know, I think that was the thing that really got me like, okay, now you're declared. Dude. Yeah. Now you're yeah. out. Yeah. Um, but you didn't but, have any family or... Uh, no, I was fortunate. Friends, I was lucky but... that way. I didn't have family ties in. I wasn't going to lose a brother, a sister, a mother, a father if I took this stand. And yeah. Milton had passed away in 2008. So when he was alive, I was quiet because I was like, listen, man, this is your school. This is your, you have the primary relationship here. Mm -hmm. You know, I spoke with him honestly about it, but I stayed quiet. But he had passed away in 2008. It was my school now. So I was yeah. like, okay, I'm going to write a play. What's with you and this connection to these old dudes that worked with Elwin Hubbard? Didn't Mario Feniger also uh, yep. have interaction? Yeah, I was going to mention for people that don't know yep. Mario was a, he was a noted concert pianist in his time. Yep. He was uh, internationally. And he started the Paris concert. original Paris org, if I remember. Yeah. And he was an early Hubbard. advocate of Scientology. He was yep. part of the original celebrity project to bring people in. And he himself had brought in Even some Jen, people. Yeah. yeah. He brought in uh, David Campbell uh, and a few no. other really notable people. So he was actually a, a kind of a big figure in Scientology. Yeah. And, yeah. and he, he continued to have a school. He had, I forget his partner's name, but I know when my son was, my older son was nine, he wanted piano lessons and that's who we took him to. His old, his partner, you probably know yeah, him. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Yeah. Tall really guy. sweet, really sweet guy. Was a top. Yeah, my, Ian. Was, Ian. Ian. Yeah. Great guy. He was uh teaching my son piano so they, they were just these great guys i think we actually so, shot with mario did he used to have that spot right off the 101 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he lived in this really famous apartment that like no, where they one. shot it, where they shot like sunset boulevard with you know like yeah a movie it's like and it's, it, next it's in my movie. play you know is, is it that same is it that the same first one? scene of the play that uh, an adult student comes to him who has in been referred point. to referred to him by Scientology, although I never mentioned the name of, right. of the, the organization. Uh, and he says, 10,000 cars pass my window every day. At least. Goes, but you stopped. You came up the stairs. You know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that, yeah. that apartment was so yes. amazing. Was there. Yeah. Wow. I, I remember that apartment. I got used to take my son there for piano lessons. So. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up, guys. We did. Uh, I think that was pretty good with Alan. It was great. Appreciate you. This is amazing well. to see you guys. I mean, again, yeah. for people who, who may be watching this, I haven't seen either of these guys in 20 something years. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
uh, I, again, I read Mark's book when it came out, but I haven't seen you. And Mitch, I've thought about you so many times, well, wondering in, out, still, and I can't remember how your book came. I was like, instantaneously, read, I read that book in like one day. Wow. Um, and I'm so happy that we were able to get in touch. Uh, I think yeah. Mike Rinder gave me your email or yeah. helped in some way. Yeah. Um, but uh, I look forward to seeing you in person. And this, oh, this to me, I, I, I was like, uh, when you texted and said, would you want to do this thing? I was just like thrilled. Couldn't, couldn't wait to cover some of this t territory. It's amazing. Right. Nice. Nice. Well, we appreciate it. Um, let me just put up some, uh, if you, uh, if you want to learn more about the Beverly Hills Playhouse, that's a link. To yeah. The Beverly Hills Playhouse is still, uh, still one of the big acting schools in LA. And, uh, since Milton passed away 15 years ago, uh, I took over the school and that's most of my activity these days is, uh, teaching there, running that business. And then as a playwright, um, uh, but yeah, uh, if you, if you want to find out about the school, we're still quite active. And then you also wrote a book called The Oasis of Insanity. And that's the story of yes. the Hills Playhouse. So if you want to read all it's about it. It's the story of my men. The first part of it is the first 100 pages is the story of my mentorship with Milton, which is a classic old school uh, story. Uh, and there's a whole chapter in there on Scientology because it was such a big part of his life and then right. my life. And I basically sort of declare what the new... Uh, thing is for the playhouse with regard to Scientology, but it tells all the story of Milton and what we alluded to in this talk of how he was like celebrated and then kind of kicked to the curb uh, under right, the, right. the scavenge regime. Right. Nice. And then also we got Mitch's site. If you guys want to check out uh, what Mitch is up to, and then Mitch also has a new book on Amazon, yep. Scientology: yep. The Big uh, Big Lie. And um, yeah, you can check that out. And all these links are in the description as well. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I enjoyed this. I love uh, I love it when we can get some uh, some new faces and some new stories on here. And uh, yeah, Alan, uh, yeah. provided in uh, spades today. Yeah, cool. This, this really meant a lot to us, Alan. Thanks, we really appreciate it. Absolutely, such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Until next time. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help support the channel, feel free to check out the merch store link in the description. We have Hail Zenu, Zenu is my homeboy, and BFG branded mouse pads, shirts, mugs, all sorts of other stuff in there that helps us to bring you new content on a regular basis. You can also pick up a copy of my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology in hardback, Kindle, and Audible versions as well. There's also a link to our podcast, and you can get that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to watch another video, you can click on this link right here, or you can click on this one here, or you can click on the subscribe button right here. Thanks a lot. Until next time.